Hello and welcome to your Global Markets Technical Outlook for the end of quarter four and the end indeed of the whole of 2022. Normal disclaimers apply and the quote this time comes from the ancient Roman Stoic Seneca who says luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Always worth bearing in mind when you come up against these uh, volatile markets that we're seeing at the moment. As we switch into the US stock market and as it's the last update for the year, let's have a look at the very, very long term chart of the Dow going all the way back to the uh, start of the previous century. Uh, we can see here how once again the market's characterized by these long secular bear markets punctuated by these uh, sweeping up moves in the market. And if we put the uh, percentage moves on there, we can see that uh, you know, 1500% or 13, 1400% has happened a couple of times. We can say that with certainty. And the latest move here is done almost about 500% from that 2009 bear market low. Uh, so this tells us a couple of things. One, we could be uh, either a quarter or a third of the way through this uh, current move up. And the second thing it tells us is that uh, drawdowns within these overall up moves do take place uh, where the market was down around 20 percent and you know here's the 1987 crash which was uh, fairly sizable tens of percent down and you can see now it's just a tiny little blip on that up move so so the trend is definitely up uh, we're not seeing any signs of uh, these sort of sideways secular bear markets that we have uh, seen in the past and certainly in the recent past uh, so over the very long term, you would have to be uh, more bullish than bearish. But um, that uh, doesn't necessarily apply when we get down to these smaller time frames, as we will now looking at the monthly chart we can see that we have had that sell off back from that high of 4800 and despite you know having a couple of decent months recently it does look like that's perhaps just a bounce within this overall bear market i still think 3400 will be tested at some point and uh, the we would uh, may see that happen sooner rather than later if this market does take off once again to the downside but uh, as you can see, the overall up tr uh, trend is up, but uh, we s are s certainly in a correction at the moment. And if we zoom into the weekly chart, we can see that the profile of this move down is very much corrective. These overlapping highs and lows, certainly not impulsive as on the scale that we saw back here in 2020 with the, the COVID crash. It definitely is more corrective in nature. And that tells us that perhaps uh, once this is uh, washed out, we will see another move to the upside rather than a crash. On the Ichimoku chart, we are below the cloud, both by price and the Chiku span or lagging line. So that does tell us that this market is in bearish territory and will remain so until both the price and the Chiku span can recapture the top side of the cloud, which currently sits around that 4,000 to 4,200 level. If we see price eking up towards that level, we would expect uh, resistance to be found. We would expect supply to come back into the market, at least initially, as it did here on that first retest after it crossed it uh, back in the middle of uh, this year. Switch into the fundamentals now. And if we look firstly to the S&P 500 market breadth, and we can see here that almost 70% of stocks are actually showing bullish patterns. So that's certainly a positive, but you can see here from the price action on the S&P 500 below that the market is not really reacting to that uh, from the upside. And one of, the, one of the reasons for that, of course, is that the uh, S&P 500 is a market cap weighted index and the large stocks that dominate that uh, market cap are the uh, large growth stocks, which, uh, which are fair, fairly beaten down. And while they're small in number, they're big in effect when it comes to the index, uh, as we'll see and when we get a bit deeper into this. So, so despite this being a, a highish number, it's not translating into to a bullish upside for the uh, index just yet. 
And if we look across the whole of the NYSE, we can see that this rather uh, tepid uh, number of 43% of stocks above their 200-day moving average. So how, how does that marry with the previous chart? Well, what it tells us is that the stocks have been so beaten down that while they're making bullish patterns uh, to increase the size of that bullish percent number, it's not getting them back above the level that of their 200 day moving average for most of the stocks for for greater than 50% of the stocks. So whilst the short term move has been up, the longer term direction is lower. And we can see that come through in some of the um, cross market analysis. If we look here at the discretionary versus staples, this still very much uh, in a southerly direction with uh, the you know headwinds against it. This uh, this of course indicates that uh, consumers are uh, preferring to spend their money on staples rather than discretionary items and that will tend to hurt certainly the manufacturing industry, uh, sector of the market and uh, the wider uh, market itself as you can see the market falling while well, this ratio is falling too and we don't tend to see the market moving up until this uh, this relationship re reverses you can see back here in 2020 the discretionary versus staple ratio actually moved up uh, early compared to how long it took the um, uh, the S&P 500 to regain its old high. So it's a leading indicator and we'll keep an eye for when that turns, which will be when the, we can expect the market to, to start acting a little bit more bullish in the, the medium term. On the semiconductors versus the S&P 500, again, this is also falling higher highs, higher lows. We haven't seen a, a, a higher peak than the previous one just yet. That's, in other words, it's agreeing with the market conditions and there's no uh, divergence uh, on offer just at the moment. Same here on the advanced decliners, this uh, also moving in a downward direction, lower highs, lower lows, same as the market, no sign of any divergence to the upside just yet. Just sort of dancing around its uh, short term moving average there, but uh, you would have to expect that the, uh, the, the direction of travel is down, therefore um, the path of least resistance is lower for, uh, for the advanced decline line. One we don't often look at, uh, but which is interesting to check in with uh, now and again is the Baltic Dry Index. This is effectively the cost of uh, shipping uh, globally. And once again, uh, I mean, this is this is a very pure supply and demand driven um, measure of uh, commerce around the world. So you can see here that uh, the S&P 500 down, of course, and uh, with the inflation rising, uh, that's having an impact on consumer demand and therefore shipping prices are hitting lower. So once again, we're not uh, we're not seeing any divergence to the upside from from any of these more. Uh, what would you expect to, to sometimes be leading indicators? Uh, as we come up towards the end of the 12 months, of course, we can sort of check in with how the indexes have gone. And uh, well, it's a D minus all around in terms of their performance. Uh, S&P 500 and the Russell uh, both uh, coming in around that sort of minus 18, minus 19 percent. But it's really the Nasdaq that's been hit the hardest down almost 30 percent. And that's where a lot of those big growth stocks that I mentioned earlier hang out. Uh, so they're, they're the ones that have really uh, taken a knock uh, that's brought everything else down with it. Uh, but you can see that relatively the smaller caps, which uh, which are uh, make up the Russell, have done uh, better on a, on a relative basis into the yield curve now and we can see well this this is really is a picture perfect uh, inversion if uh, ever there was one where we have the very short term. Uh, cost of money uh, around about uh, that four and a bit percent and uh, the longer you leave your money on deposit with the treasury the US treasury uh, the less return you will get uh, so that's obviously driven by a, 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 a rising cash rate a rising uh, interest rate from the central bank and a lot of bondholders are deciding that uh, that they want to hold short term. They're not interested in holding more long term, and 
the line is inverted. And wh why is that important? Well, it's important because it's often a leading indicator of uh, a recession and a bear market. So we can see here back in 2000, we got an inverted uh, yield curve and that sort of um, predated the tech wreck uh, 2000 bear market. Uh, in 2007, the, the yield curve went flat. It didn't quite invert, but even still, uh, that predated that uh, bear market we had there. And with this so-called normal shape, where the where the short-term uh, bonds are paying a, a, a lower rate than the more longer-term bonds, is what we would expect to see in a what's called a so-called risk-on environment, uh, where. Uh, investors are willing to take risk on the stock market uh, because uh, money is cheaper on a, on a short term basis. Um, and this this is when you get those large growth stocks will will uh, do well because uh, they're they're investing money now and their gains are out in the future. So they're very much sensitive to to interest rate moves. Uh, when interest rates rise and we get these flat or inverted yield curves that's going to affect those big growth stocks and they're going to be sold down because they're not as attractive. And when it gets to an extreme as it is at the moment, uh, where we have the yield of the three month bond uh, crossed higher than the yield of the 10 year bond. So you can get more return if you like for just holding a three month uh, bond than you can for holding a 10 year one, then that is uh, an important and very reliable signal of a pending uh, recession. And we can see this, this basically charts that ratio that we've just looked at uh, where the when the three month bond is uh, rising faster than the 10 year yield, uh, yield both yields, then um, then we get the this move higher. And you can see here when it crosses above the zero line, that's that's basically an inversion. And you can see how reliable it's been almost every time we've had an inversion. It's been followed in the next sort of 12 to 18 months by a recession. So uh, we I guess we can say that uh, with with a high probability that we should probably we'll see at least a recession in the in the US and and perhaps globally as well. On the sentiment indicator, we see this actually quite high at the moment. So uh, this remember this is uh, inversely correlated to the stock market index itself. So um, when this ratio uh, goes up, that indicates that uh, certainly there's a lot of fear around and there's a lot of insurance being bought in the forms of uh, puts contracts versus uh, call contracts. And what tends to happen is when everybody's on one side of the extreme, then we get a reversal in the market. And in this case, this would indicate a reversal to the upside. But given that we have had a bit of a rally lately, I'm a little bit... Uh, um, loath to to say that that's exactly what was going to happen this time. I think probably what's more likely is that this will probably have to go a little bit further and we get more downside in the market. Uh, but at the same time, we're probably not going to get a crash because markets don't tend to crash when everyone expects it, which is uh, where we are right now. Everybody is expecting a crash. They're all loading up on the puts and the market will do the opposite eventually. But uh, whether it does it sooner rather than later, I'm not so sure. And on the volatility index, you can see here that we're still stuck in this range of uh, what I've called elevated risk between about 20-ish and, and the high 30s, uh, which indicates once again that risk just remains elevated. Uh, people are, the investors are, are more willing to, to have insurance against their portfolios and they're willing to pay that premium uh, because they think that the, the environment remains uncertain. We, we've obviously got the, the S&P 500 down at the moment. It's not had a great year um, and we're not certainly nowhere near this uh, low risk area. It's it's unusual to have these extended periods of elevated risk. Normally we would expect it to drop down back into this low risk uh, area. And we can see that if we look at the very long term chart of the VIX, 
Uh, you can see here how we're in this extended elevated period, whereas following a crash such as the GFC, we would expect it to go back into this low risk area for, uh, you know, for a number of years until the next event, which we had, which was COVID. Briefly, it, it went back into that low risk area, but then it's remained elevated ever since. So, so we're in a little bit of a heightened uh, period. Uh, which is unusual. Um, so we'll have to wait and see how that uh, plays out. But it just does indicate that uh, volatility is around and, and likely to be with us for a while. On the seasonality now, we can see that this, uh, on the, certainly on the annual seasonality, how we have had that that low that it was forecasting in around October does seem to have chimed with uh, what the year to date actually does down the bottom here. And we have had a little rally. It's certainly not on the um, on the magnitude that th this uh, seasonality chart is, uh, indicates that we may have had. But um, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a little uh, rally up. Um, so but given that it's it's not been very impulsive in nature, it does look like it's more of a correction higher in the overall downtrend of these higher highs and uh, lower lows, certainly uh, for my money at the moment. The midterm year cycle has had a little bit more luck. We did have this, the cycle was forecasting this large downtrend move through the middle of the year, which certainly we, we got something along those lines. And then a breakout of the uh, trend, which we which we have also had. Once again, it's not nearly of the magnitude that the uh, the cycle indicates, but, uh, but it, nevertheless, it has broken out of that little channel and it's just kind of tracking sideways, I guess, at the moment. This is another view of that same mid-year uh, presidential seasonality cycle. It's forecasting the low a little bit later, back in uh, sort of late October. As you can see here, we had the low very early in October, um, which is so we're, so we're running a little bit ahead of the cycle. But um, uh, yeah, the cycle once again indicates more of a, a move up towards the end of the year. And we're, we're, we're just not seeing evidence of that just right at the minute. And on the decade cycle chart, well, you know, to, to year two doesn't uh, look like it's ever very flash, uh, which we're in 2022, obviously. We've had more of a down year than a sideways year, but it does indicate that perhaps uh, the better times are to come. Three, four, five and six tend to be more up years. So uh, we can uh, uh, hope, hope that the this uh, cycle decides to, to kick in at some point uh, next year. Switching to the Aussie stock market now and certainly on the monthly chart where you can see that the Aussie stock market's actually been doing much better on a relative basis than the S&P 500. It's back above that 7200 level after a couple of uh, strong months and just kind of retesting that level just right at the minute. Um, so you can see how it bounced off this longer term trend line and, and made a move higher. So, I mean, it's it's nothing more than sideways at the moment through here. It's obviously done nothing since the mid of 2021. Uh, but nevertheless, it does have a little bit more hope, uh, given that it's uh, kind of broken through that uh, downtrend line, which I haven't drawn in, but you can sort of imagine it coming down here. So perhaps a little bit of a breakout, a little bit of a double bottom there, which the uh, the XGO does love doing, loves these little dub double bottoms. Um, you often get them. And perhaps that is a sign that we're seeing some uh, green shoots uh, so we can try and get out of this uh, horrible sideways uh, pattern that we've been in for the last uh, couple of years. On the Uchimoku chart, the price has actually just broken through the cloud. Uh, but, you know, I've put a little asterisk here because while well, the cloud is now below it, around about 7,000, our Chiku span or our lagging line hasn't quite come through the cloud yet. And you need them both to, to be through to be able to say that the market's definitely bullish. So this the we, did, we need another probably a couple of hundred points to get the lagging line through at this point. It's just stuck in the middle of that uh, green area there where, that I've arrowed. Um, but, you know, it's certainly uh, nearly there, let's just say. Um, but should this price fall back through the cloud, then, then it, that would be a, a failed uh, break. 
And look at how we've done against the Asian and uh, US uh, indexes. Well, the best, really. Number one out of this, certainly out of this group of uh, four or five, the XJO has done the best, lo losing only about two or three percent for the year. Uh, Nikkei comes next, around about four percent. Then we've got the Shanghai down about 12, S&P about 18, and the Hang Seng bringing up the rear around about down 20 percent. So on a relative basis, uh, the XJO has had a good year. You can see that illustrated here on this uh, ratio of the XJO versus the S&P 500, which it lost a lot of ground through those years of 2020, 2022. But since the start of 2022, it's actually been motoring on a relative basis. So it has been uh, doing much, much better than the S&P 500 on a relative basis, uh, certainly in the last couple of years on the currencies now and well as expected the US dollar did sort of tap out uh, up at those overbought levels uh, where it was you know certainly getting into nosebleed territory around about that 114 level it's come back and again as expected it's retested this 104 support level where it goes from here is uh, is is going to be interesting because it will either drop down back into the pattern here or else it might have another go at that 114 level but you you got to say that the tailwind is with it at the moment to the upside uh, everything is is pointing in that direction so it's the it's the dollar's uh, game to lose here if it, if it can't hold that 104 uh, level but that small sell-off in the dollar has helped the other currencies on a relative basis. The Aussie dollar uh, was down here. I did think we'd probably get a test of that 60 level. Didn't quite get there. It's just bounced higher and uh, sort of hanging around that 67, 68 level. But once again, you can see that the trend is definitely lower and a retest of the, of the 60 level is probably still not out of the question. Uh, the euro has also had a good uh, little fillip in its uh, price here. Uh, it's broken back above parity. That's the parity line there at a dollar. And it's just retesting its own uh, 105 level. So be again interesting to see uh, if if the if we continue to see dollar weakness then we would obviously expect the euro to to uh, push up through that 105 level and back into this uh, area of congestion that we've got here on the chart between 105 and about 120. Uh, should the US dollar start to motor to the upside again then I think we we would be back below uh, parity once again for the euro. On the British pound, well, it just missed actually click, clicking through parity. Uh, I've drawn it in there. Uh, keep keep an eye on that. It's it's back at a dollar twenty one. It's back above this uh, support level at a dollar twenty. So for now, it's looking relatively safe. They have they had yet another change of uh, prime minister uh, between then and uh, now. So uh, so th perhaps that's um, giving the uh, dollar, the, I beg your pardon, the pound traders uh, a little bit more hope. On the Japanese yen, it's, well, it, it's also been getting hammered by the strong dollar and it's had a, a, a good month, uh, let's say, um, recently um, because of that dollar sell-off, but it's still stuck way below this original support, uh, support line. Remember, this is yen to the dollar, so we're, we're looking at very, very small numbers here. 0 0.008 is the uh, now resistance line that the, that the yen has to, has to look towards, which is still, as you can see, a fair distance away from where the market is right now. On the Bitcoin, well, of course, if you've been following the news and uh, all the uh, woes of the FTX collapse, uh, that obviously hasn't helped the um, crypto markets in general and Bitcoin in uh, particular down around 75% from its high here up at 69,000 that actually made it to and it's back around about, well, you can pick one up for under 17 grand now. So um, get amongst it. <laughs> if you fancy being a long time, long term holder, then there's never been a, a better time to buy, as they say. And finishing up on the commodities, uh, looking to crude oil, definitely seeing some softness 
in the crude oil price again due to that uh, ballooning dollar which uh, which oil is priced in also the uh, falling demand that we're seeing uh, due to the impending recession and uh, increasing inflation numbers is uh, softening the uh, oil price overall back below the 75 dollar area now sitting around 72 and it's there's a fair bit of uh, momentum behind this move so uh, a move lower back into the 60s, I think, would uh, not be uh, unusual. Uh, wheat price also falling. Demand is seeing the, the price uh, falling here. And uh, I may be wrong, but I think they've, uh, the Russians have agreed to allow uh, Ukraine wheat to start flowing again from the ports. So, so that's, uh, that's going to help with the, uh, with the supply side as well. Um, but, you know, still remaining very elevated compared to where it has been back here around these sort of four to five hundred uh, levels. On the gold, it's still kind of toying with this 1800, 1900 area. Doesn't really want to give up yet. Um, you know, we had this beautiful looking double top. Uh, it's obviously fallen back through the bottom of that pattern, but then it's kind of just bounced up a little bit. Currently testing that 1800 level. Um, again, you can see the inverse pattern of the US dollar there, but almost picture perfect as well. So gold very much probably influenced by what happens next with the uh, US dollar. On the copper, again, these are all affected hugely by the, uh, the US dollar. Again, falling when the dollar was rising, now rising when the dollar is falling. Um, and just kind of in the middle of this big pattern that we've got between about $2 and about $4.5 or $5, you could say now. Uh, it's just a big uh, sideways. Obviously, copper is a big story of the future, so it's probably a great long-term investor uh, investment. Um, I guess the question you'd be asking yourself is: is is this the cheapest it's going to get, or is it going to get even cheaper before we see that sort of long-term demand kick in? And finishing up on iron ore, well, it's kind of just also in the doldrums, uh, falling demands, hitting the price uh, of iron ore. It's had a couple of uh, decent. Uh, weeks lately but uh, just stuck above that uh, well st stuck let's call it between about 80 and about 126 in, the, in that area there uh, no real sort of directional um, component uh, to to write home about at the moment so uh, sideways I guess for iron ore so just to wrap that up on the US stock market, certainly in that uh, downtrend at the moment, there's no sign that I can really see that we're going to get the big uh, Santa Claus rally uh, coming towards the end of this year. But, you know, we're still, it's not even the end of uh, the second week of December. So I could end up uh, eating my hat on that one. Uh, the Aussie 200 is showing relative strength compared to the S&P 500. It's, it's been motoring along uh, on a relative basis and certainly back looking strong back towards its uh, all time highs. And on the US dollar, of course, while it has been strong, it's weakened uh, just lately. And that's allowed uh, some of the cross currencies, uh, most of the cross currencies, in fact, to show a rally. And finally, on the commodities, well, uh, I think recession coming just over the horizon, as we saw with the yield curve, is having an impact as well as that strong uh, US dollar. That about wraps it up for me. I hope you've enjoyed the updates this year. I look forward to bringing you more in 2023 and I wish you all the best for your trading and investing in 2023. Uh, good luck, good trading, uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year.